podcast. I'm Martha Lane Fox and I have two jobs. I am President of the British Chambers of Commerce and I am Chancellor of the Open University, which I think we can agree are two of the best jobs in the world. And I'm really pleased to have two fantastic women here with me today, colleagues from the British Chambers of Commerce, Siobhan Haviland and Jen Grattan. Thank you for coming. I'm going to come back and ask you to tell us a bit more about what you do in a second. But we're looking at skills in the UK in this podcast based on the OU's recent business barometer. Anyway, first, Siobhan, tell me a bit about your amazing job, because I think you have next best job after me. <laughs> uh, so I am the Director General of the British Chambers of Commerce. That sounds very grand. Do you have well, a robe? As someone said... Wow, you're a director and a general. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's really cool. Um, I'm all in for robes if anyone's off. Okay, fine. Yes, yes, and jewels. Listeners, take notes. <laughs> uh, so we represent the 53 chambers of the UK, which have 60,000 accounting businesses as their members. And the Julian R. Crown, 79 and counting British chambers around the world. So really, really impressive global network. And our job is to make sure that the UK uh, is the best place to start, grow and invest in a business. And Jane, how do you help this work, which I know you do very deeply. And I also know you're a Kung Fu expert. You don't <laughs> just bring Kung Fu skills to the British Chambers. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm a director in the policy unit at the British Chambers, but for the last seven years or so, I've majored on employment and skills issues. So this is talking to businesses about their skills needs and talking to government about what they can do to, to help businesses fill those jobs. So we all work together on the British Business Council that we established last year at the British Chambers to bring businesses together to talk about the big issues that face them. Siobhan, what's the work that we've been doing in that and why is it important? Yes, yes indeed. So last uh, summer together we launched the Business Council to oversee the Future of the Economy initiative. So we believe that the UK needs a long-term economic strategy and this is us working with our business partners from all over the country to try and develop that. And it has five main work streams developed together with, with our businesses. So firstly, green innovation. So how are we getting our nation to net zero, but how are we innovating in green products and services? Uh, second is global Britain, Britain's place in the world, the world's place in the UK. Local economies of the future, you know, our places, our high streets, how we ensure they are thriving. Digital revolution, of course, AI, how we are capturing the upsides, but how we are guarding against the downsides. And then the thing we're talking about today, people and work and people's skills journey through through life. But you know, arguably, and presumably, Jane, you would agree with this too, as you're a skills expert, skills are through all of that, right? You know, when we launched the green innovation work and transition to net zero, we've got a huge opportunity around green jobs in this country. If we can find people to do them, just as we need people to fill AI jobs, then quantum jobs and all the other things coming down the track. So how do you see all the bits linking together? Yeah, well, people are the most important part of any business. Mm. People run businesses and we need people to um, deliver the outputs. Not at robots yet. Not quite. <laughs> well, absolutely not. But, I mean, the world of skills is changing really quickly. We have um, a more automated workforce, more digital workforce, net zero imperatives to meet. Um, and so we are on a journey, I think, where everyone is going to have to upskill and reskill continuously. But, you know, the, the, the need for skills... It runs all the way through those five reports that you've all mentioned. One of the things we've covered in the podcast is quite specific examples of businesses working with businesses to help with their skills or just how local areas are approaching businesses. But I think the strength of the Chamber Network is we see this kind of at a macro level, don't we? So what are some of the things you're hearing about skills and people, Siobhan, when you travel around, put your flat hat, your hard hat in your flat jacket on and talk to businesses? Uh, yeah, I do have the great privilege of travelling the country and meeting businesses from, from all over. My geography of the UK is second <laughs> to one now and my use of uh, British Rail. Um, so, it, yeah, which is fantastic and you really hear it, you know, firsthand. And honestly, the number one thing, except maybe in the energy crisis, the number one thing that businesses tell us is they can't get enough people and they can't get people with the right skills mm. and when you can't get people for, for your business because as Jane said businesses are people it means you can't 
grow, you can't take on new contracts, you can't expand your business, you can't develop new products. And actually, it also means that the people that you do have are under, you know, under more strain because they're sort of filling in for the gaps that, that you're carrying. So, uh, you know, for as an economy, it is constraining us in terms of growth. So it, it absolutely is number one important. And why do you think we've, why have we ended up here? Why has this happened? Because I think what I hadn't appreciated, I became president of British Chambers 18 months ago-ish, mm -hmm. and I have always been in tech, sort of. So tech has always got a skills crisis because you're always inventing something new and you can never quite have enough people to do it. I don't think I had appreciated that is true across so many sectors and regions of the economy. How have we ended up here? Yeah, well, you're right. Skill shortages are pervasive, but... In the last few years, a number of things have, have happened and come together to really exacerbate the problem. Mm -hmm. So we've had Brexit, massive economic shock, um, but that's curtailed the pipeline of global talent uh, considerably for businesses. So it's much more difficult to recruit for vacancies now. I think on top of that, we had the pandemic. People left their jobs, they changed their working patterns, and a number of people, unfortunately, have not returned to the workforce. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of women as well. A lot of women, absolutely. Uh, and then on top of that, we've got, you know, the changing nature of the workforce, as we said, with the, um, you know, the, the, the different industry trends driving change. And then we've got this aging workforce. Mm -hmm. Lots of employers saying to us, I'm really worried that I'm going to lose the skills I've got now with no, ta no talent pipeline to replace them. Yeah, and something actually I've touched on with a couple of people we've been talking to is this idea about then the just the changing nature of how long you will work and what that means for your yeah. careers. You know, I think I've got seven year old children and there's no question in my mind they'll be working till a hundred yeah. probably. That's and that's something I don't think we've kind of internalized in our economy, have we? Yeah. It's just it's so many different factors. So what have you seen that works? Javon, give us some some hope. You're good at hope. <laughs> what have you seen that works where businesses are, are cracking this problem? So so what I like to say to audiences sometimes is, I'm going to test it on you, Martha, because okay. I already tested it on Jane. Um, <laughs> after you leave education, what are the two main things you do in life? Go on, the two things you do. What do you do? You, well, you work. You work, yeah, that's one. And, and you hang out with people you're not at work with. Yeah, <laughs> your right, family, right. I guess. Yeah. So one, you work, yeah. and two, it's all about relationships. Yes. Friends, family, yes. partners, whatever that makes. So those two things. How much do you learn about those two things in school? <laughs> oh, so little. Yeah. So, so you know, our education of, you know, British education is second to none in, in, in the world uh, in lots of different ways but we are not bringing the world of work into our schools, into our education settings. So we have a, a, a great shortage of ad careers advice capacity in most schools. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, probably have, a, I would say, a, a lack of systemic engagement between workplaces mm -hmm. and educational settings. Yeah. And we were moving in the right direction with new T levels, new vocational training, apprenticeships, and, and so on. Um, but the other thing is, it's cultural, isn't it? So we sort of think, oh, we leave school or we leave university at 18, 21, whatever it may be. Job done, done. We don't need to go back to that again. And, and actually, we, I'm probably, you know, maybe our, you know, generation behind us, really, it's the first time that. You, the world has changed. So my dad worked for the same company for 30 years. We won't do that and the, the kids behind us won't do that. So we actually have to change our culture to think about this lifelong learning piece. You know, how, how can I change and adapt and as I go through my, my career? So, you know, where we see, when we see this all the time where we, around the country, we see great examples of businesses going into schools, businesses having young people come into their workplace, um, or businesses, you know, thinking about the pathways for their people and, and where, what they might want to learn on the way. And of course, Open University do that, you know, in spades. So we do see great examples of it, it but yet it's just, it's not enough. It's not, and it's not uh, ingrained in our system yet. Do you have anything to add from a kind of policy perspective? Well, lots of employers are saying to us, help me to fill my skills gaps. Mm -hmm. I can't recruit successfully now. I'm not getting the candidates for the roles. There's a skills mismatch. So what can I do myself? And, you know, what we're saying is the in-work progression, the in-work training is really critically important. So we're going to see 
you know, much more emphasis, I think, on lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. And the short modular courses, apprenticeships are brilliant, employers yeah. tell us. They, they, employers love them. They do. But they're not the solution to every problem. Mm -hmm. And where we need to get people upskilled, retrained, reskilled really quickly for an opportunity that the business has and a progression opportunity that the individual has, we've got to have that agility in the system. You know, the micro credentials, the the short modular accredited courses that help people on their on their journey. So I think that I think that's going to be particularly important. But I think the other thing that we need to do is have much more of a an understanding between employers and the education system on what those skills are, when they're going to be needed, and make sure that the you know the job opportunities that employers are creating are aligned with the training provision mm -hmm. and the careers advice. Uh, and and uh, education that young people are getting so that you know people are moving into those jobs seamlessly really and, yes. and employers don't have these skill shortages one of the things that i've heard a couple of times both when talking to people for this podcast but also when i've been traveling about is the success of the local skills improvement plans mm -hmm. and i know the british chambers is very active in those can you explain what they are and how they work and how we could make them even more powerful so local skills improvement plans, there are 38 across England. Chambers of Commerce are running 32 of them. And these are really brilliant ideas. That's why they're working so well. Oh, yes. <laughs> Indeed, of course. The, the brilliant idea yeah. of helping employers, many of whom have not really been involved in a skills conversation before, to, to come around the table and can say... Can you give us a more specific example so people can kind of picture what, that, what a business might be? who the business might be that might do that and how they're working. Okay, so it might be a, a small manufacturing business or a, a marketing agency yeah. really struggling to fill their, their job vacancies. And they, they, they come into the local skills improvement plan that the uh, system that the chamber is convening and talking to providers about, you know, these are the jobs that I'm creating. These, this is where my industry is, is moving to. These are the skills I, I need in my business. What training is available now? And if there isn't the training available, helping those local uh, skills providers or national skills providers to, to shape the curriculum so that it is meeting those uh, those skills need. <coughs> excuse me, those skills needs. Um, and I was saying then linking back into um, people coming through the education system so that they are aware of the opportunities and taking the right decisions in their in their their things the the, the um, choices that they are making at that level. So. It's about aligning everything at the local level. Um, we're a year in. Mm -hmm. um, already it's making a massive difference. Mm. How already. are you judging that? How? So we did, we did a piece of research, an evaluation report um, that was independent of, of the, the chamber network. So a fresh pair of eyes looking in and asking, so what? Yeah. yeah. 12 months in, so what? We've got employers um, engaged for the first time more employees, over 65,500 businesses mm, wow. coming to the table, which yeah. is not, you know, not insignificant. Yeah, it's a big, big number. Yeah. Big number. Yeah. Many of whom have never been asked this yeah, question. never been asked before. Yeah, That's, that's very surprising, uh, isn't it? So they, they're coming to the table. Um, they are now working with providers, say, knocking on the door of providers and saying, can you help me? So we're creating a market now mm -hmm. for providers. Um, and then providers are saying, I've never had this level of, this granular level of detail before it's really helping me to plan what provision that I need to make so already in a very short space of time we are seeing you know the beginning of that transformation that's going to help to solve the skill shortages what we need is longer term planning of course longer term funding because it's going to take quite a while I think to get it uh, to a system where everything is working as well as it can be. Because, you know, you have to move these systems, don't you? So, you know, in an area as a sixth form college, for example, you were teaching X and now you've found out that the world's moved on and you need to teach, teach Y, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that is, you know, the, the academia doesn't move. You've got to build a curriculum. You need the, the tools for it. Just on a Monday, I was in uh, uh, Coventry at the Manufacturing Training Centre where what we're seeing apprenticeship apprentices train on incredible bits of kit mm -hmm. of how to do you know metal cutting and really sophisticated electronics but you need that kit and you know that takes a while to and you need the people to teach it you know one of the colleges I saw a, a while ago they l locally they need more more people who understand plumbing yeah um and they're you know they're paying quite a lot for people to teach plumbing but it's not as much as you earn 
if you're a plumber. <laughs> and of course, teaching not for everybody. It's quite intimidating as an idea to a lot of, even though they're obviously experts in their field. So, but but bringing together you, you, businesses to tell to talk to educators about what yeah. they need. I mean, we've just seen even just having those conversations has moved things on, hasn't it? Because they talk in different languages yes. too. So, educators talk about skills, job. You know, businesses talk about jobs. Yeah. Jo job and descriptions, yes. you know, that, that, task that sort of thing. Yeah. And there's a whole other area that was really uncovered, which is actually more about the softer side of work readiness, mm. getting young people just yeah, ready. That. That's come up a few times. What do you go into that? a yeah. business, factory, office, whatever it may be, um, you know, and, and the, the sort of confidence, mm. communication, critical thinking type skills that that are there, they're there in those young people that need to be brought out. Yes, and I feel very lucky that I was given quite specific tasks and actions around that when I first started working, but that is not the case for many people, is it? And you have to, as an employer, spend time and investment, and it might not always be a priority to do those things. Um, Joan, you are constantly on speed dial with delete is appropriate, the chancellor, the shadow chancellor, the PM, all the private secretaries, the different people in the civil service, are people listening? What happens when you make this case? Do you think this is understood politically, the, I would say, crisis that we face with skills and the numbers bear that out, our research, the OU's research? How, what's the political landscape against all of this? Yeah, I think absolutely all parties are listening. And, it, and because it's not just me who says it, right? <laughs> it is like every business they meet. Um, and of course, they recognise that it's, it's, it's holding back our growth as an economy. Um, it's, you know, there's a lot of good stuff going on. There is a lot of good stuff going on. And as I, we referenced apprenticeships yes. earlier, there's been you know, moves in it to ensure the levy's working, bring in T-levels, et cetera, careers and enterprise company. So there's, there is a, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Um, we need to keep moving like LSIPs, moving down that, moving down that path. But, but what we would say is the challenge that we have is because we don't, have a national, yes. e what I call it what you like, long-term economic plan, industrial strategy, whatever you want to label it, a plan for the UK economy, because dropping out of that, of course, will, will be a skills plan. Yes. So if you know where your economy is going, you know what skills you need to drive it in that direction. And without that, we're a little bit, you know, it's a little bit fragmented still in, in places. Um, so that's what we'd like to see more of and then you know everyone's heading in in the same direction um and and you've got to balance us training our people uh ensuring people who are not in work if they're out on long-term sick i can help you know help back into the workforce if people need childcare, mm -hmm. for example you know you've seen some changes from this government recently there's yeah. you know more to do in terms of just capacity uh, and our immigration system so an immigration system that's fit for the purposes of our economy yeah so I'm going to wave a magic wand for you both. You'd both be spectacular prime ministers. I'm just interested Thanks. to know, I mean, this could be an opportunity to launch any bids you might be interested <laughs> in heading out there to the public. But if you were really only allowed one wish in policy terms around this agenda, what would you both pick? What do you think makes the biggest uh, uh, I would pick um, the ability for every child uh, at school to go into a workplace like at least a couple of times in their time in school because mm. without seeing it and experiencing it, it's really hard to understand. Mm. You know, it may well be that your parents are like one's a teacher and one's a nurse, right? So how would you have any idea what yes. it looked like to run lastminute.com or run a <laughs> I, I had no or... <laughs> idea what that looked like, just to be clear. You know, or, or, or work in a factory. You wouldn't. And that's, that's totally normal mm -hmm. and vice versa. You know, you both your people, if your parents are business people, you've never been in a hospital setting as an employee. So I think that would really drive, drive understanding. And you, Jane, you yeah. have one too. So the future talent pipeline is, of course, really important. But actually, 80% of your future work, workforce is in work now. Yeah. So we need to do a lot more about upskilling and reskilling, but getting some of people who aren't working because they're facing different barriers for all sorts of reasons back into work where they can contribute and they, they can have, you know, um, better fulfilment because they, they're seeing in work progression as well. So it's about how you bring people back into work mm. uh, and how you progress them in work. Am I allowed one? 
I'm going to answer my own question. <laughs> that's terrible, isn't it? Isn't well, it? you're allowed because you're in charge. So yeah, that's it. Like, that's yeah. it. Um, yeah. Presidential chancellor, whatever, special dispensation. I think I would have to put digital at the heart of this stuff because I feel, again, I know I'm slightly brainwashed, but that is going to be such an important future plank of the economy and of any business. It doesn't matter if you're a digital business or not. Yeah. You've got to operate in a digital environment. And I do think it kind of levels the playing field if you do it well. So ensuring that we've got amazing connectivity and the right content to help people who may be displaced from a job over here because the industry changed or maybe you're trying to get into a new industry or make a pivot or never been in work. I do think we could be much more imaginative in how we use digital technology. Yeah, yeah. That's another one. Um, just to make it a bit more personal, how do you guys keep skilled up and relevant you know because I think it is a real challenge for people working to be in this lifelong learning cycle Sivon how do you think about it in terms of people that work in the British Chambers and our members and as an organization internally and then how do you think about it for you personally yeah I mean we all so in work we always think about our staff and their personal development and the balance between where we see a gap for the business and where they would personally like like to develop. Um, so we always ensure like through the year, through our appraisal system, et cetera, that, we're, 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 that people are getting you know, the, the development that they want and that, that we want. And, and so I think it, I think it works quite well. Um, and then, you know, with yourself, it's, it is something you, it probably gets left, doesn't it? Really mm -hmm. low down your list, really. Uh, and uh, especially when you get let later on in your career. So I've been recently thinking about uh, for this role, I have to do, for example, a lot of public speaking. So how can I get better at that? What are the things I can change myself to do it? And then the other thing back to your point is um, we talk a lot to our business about using the AI is you, 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 phenomenal changes we're seeing there. To I mean, it's really exciting for small and medium-sized businesses. I mean, you can just change your productivity overnight. Yep. So I need to make sure I'm reading about what the chain, new new things are. I'm 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 having a go on ChatGPT and asking it stupid questions and seeing what happens. You know, so, so you know the tools that are out there that we're sort of keeping ahead, reading-wise, and so a bit of that as well. Yeah. How about you, Jane? Beyond Kung Fu. <laughs> At a very high level, we should add. So I, I guess the nature of my role means that I'm learning all the time mm. because we're at the you know the forefront of policy. We're helping to shape mm. policy. So we're constantly reading, yeah. talking to people, understanding. But at a personal level, I really like these bite-sized bits of, of learning, particularly yeah. on the IT side because it's moving on so quickly. Yeah. So we've got a really neat system at the BCC where we can just do a short course when we're ready um, cool. online. So I like to to balance sort of uh, reading around the subject with some sort of technical skills that I can get in a, a really fast, neat way. Yeah, well, that's obviously, again, I have to make sure I give Open University full credit at this because the Open University you know, at its core is this notion that anybody can learn at any moment in their career. And um, going to do a degree ceremony in the Barbican on Friday and they're big ceremonies at the Barbican. It's always a lot of fun. I always try and make everybody, encourage them to make as much noise as possible. Mm -hmm. But... The main reason that it's so incredible is because you can see when people come across the stage at you that they either they're just desperately embarrassed and they want to get off the stage <laughs> as quickly as possible. And please don't make me do this. It's worse than having to study for five years. Or they want to tell you the story that they've brought to this moment. And they're always moving. And I'm always crying. And all the team always like, come on, get a move. I'm like, they're sobbing on the stage. You know, people who in caring responsibilities and working and doing something else, people who've you know, been a social worker for 14 years and then decided that they want to go into child psychology and train to do that while working and looking after something. You know, it, it's a lot of, lot of amazing stories. So I always feel super optimistic, actually, after that, that we've got incredible capacity, uh, both, you know, at an individual level and then at a national level to do what we're talking about. We just got to keep pushing on to encourage people to do it. Yeah, so, uh, it, it is. It's about planning for skills, isn't yeah. it? Planning nationally, as you so we need this strategy, this economic strategy. We need planning locally as local regions yes. through the LSIPs, but we also need to help businesses plan for their own skills. So planning at those three levels, then you can start to mobilise the resources to get those skills in place. So the planning bit is, is really important, I think. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. So it's 2030. We may or may not have had some changes of government, various shapes and forms by 2030. I'm not Let's take politics out of it. What would you love to see happening in Britain and what do you think we can be shooting for? You know, we don't 
maybe have the economic industrial strategy, whatever you want to call it, that you would really love Siobhan right now. But what do you, when you think about it, where are we as a country in 2030? So I would like to be able to say that. So after, I'm off to Stoke tonight. Yeah, nice. got an event tomorrow at Port Vale Football Club. Brilliant. Um, some fantastic businesses in, in, in Staffordshire, in the city. Um, I would like to say that I was going to visit a, a business and they said, uh, I, I have no shortage of amazing people from this place coming into my business, work ready, understanding how it all fits together, who just, you know, are off. And it has grown my business 30% in the last, where were we, six years. Yeah. Um, that's that's what I'd like. To, that's the outcome we'd like to hear. I like the way you said about the local nature of that. You know, we talked to um, Alwyn from Wales in this series, and she was talking about what they're doing in Wales to build that capacity locally, and that is really fundamental, isn't it? We don't want to become too parochial and too kind of insular, but you also want to make sure that local areas are really thriving. Yeah, and people don't want their young people to go away to university yeah. and not come back, yeah. right? Yeah. Or come back in like 30 years' time when they've had, yes. they've had kids. Uh, so they do. They want them to, th th you know, stay local and work locally you understand local needs and yeah absolutely and how about you 2030 <laughs> i think what would be great is in, in 2030 young people are coming out of school with the tran understanding their transferable skills mm. and having the really good basic skills in place with this love of learning yeah mm. with a real passion to, to keep learning rather than thinking it finishes when you you leave school or yeah. college or university and that they can find that training and they can move seamlessly between sectors uh, and that you know this idea of employers being able to not always look for a perfect match mm -hmm. at recruitment mm -hmm. but to be flexing recruitment as well and saying you've got those transferable skills you've got some really great experience i can i can employ you and i can develop you on the job mm -hmm. so for me it's this idea much more agile system yeah. of learning and some real sort of passion for learning for you know from people who are coming through the education system and people in work as well okay so anybody listening in positions of extreme power you've got we've got our wish list let's make it happen um just because this is the last one of our series and because we've got only just a couple of minutes left i'm going to ask you something completely ridiculous new skills that you would both love to have i'm not talking about just like personal development and things you know you need to get better at at work i'll start and be very honest i am a terrible cook i'm literally people run away from me when they think i might be providing some food for them so i would like to learn to cook better but more importantly for my business life i'd like to be able to speak a language really well because i think we're terrible at speaking languages in this country and i think it helps in terms of cultural and you know expansion and general just you know sophistication and usefulness so that's me jane how about you okay what skills? well i'm i'm less than five foot tall i'm quite petite <laughs> um I didn't notice and it's very difficult for me to get a choice of fashion clothes that I oh. like, you see. So what I'd really like to do is to learn to um, to sew. Make your own Make clothes. my own clothes. That's, that's what one. Yeah, I feel that's what achievable. I really like to do. My yeah. cooking, definitely not, but you make your clothes 100%. <laughs> Siobhan, you're perfect, of course. Obviously. <laughs> uh, I'm also a terrible cook, but I have no interest in learning uh, <laughs> and uh, a terrible linguist. But what I would, I'd love to be um, great at singing. Oh. Apparently... Oh. I don't know really if this is true, but some people say that my voice is terrible. I don't really agree with them. <laughs> but even, even if it is, I'd like, yes, I'd, I'd love to be able to sing. Well, I, I, <laughs> again, I don't want to give a personal plug, but you may or may not be aware that the country's premier karaoke business, Lucky Voice, is always open to you, Siobhan, if you need to go and practice in, <laughs> in, in a padded room. On my own, apparently, yes. <laughs> yes, yes so no one else can hear it. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both so much. It's a great pleasure to work with you both, but also to be able to talk about this topic. We've had a great time talking talking to so many thought leaders in this series. So all that's there for me to do is to remind you that this is a podcast brought to you by the Open University and the British Chambers of Commerce. And we've been talking about the OU's business barometer, but I think we can agree that with all the people we've talked to over the series, we have got the answers. We just need to help them get me executed. So thank you very much for listening. I'm Martha Lee.